let's talk about energy and temperature. So when we talk about energy, which is what temperature is an indirect measure of, um, energy is the driving force behind the chemical reactions that we might see in a lab or an experiment or something like that. And some chemical reactions release it, some absorb it, but regardless of what happens, all chemical reactions are an expression of energy in nature. So energy, it's the balance of what energy you need to make something happen versus what energy is released by something that makes some reactions very difficult versus others being very easy, like burning gasoline is much easier than producing gasoline. That said though, if we're going to define energy, energy is not a physical quantity that you can hold or put in a jar or something like that. So you need to define it by what it does. And that's what this is. The definition of energy, the ability to do work, produce heat, or change matter. Okay, we define energy by its effect on the things around it. So when we look at energy, we divide it into energy of position, potential energy, the energy that it would have, that it could gain if it was moving. So this bowling ball, for example, its potential energy comes from being held high above the ground, and the higher you hold it, the more potential energy. Whereas kinetic energy is the energy to movement. So if it's moving fast, high kinetic energy. If it's moving slow, low kinetic energy. And they kind of have an inverse thing. So if it's moving really fast, it could still potentially have some, a great deal of potential energy if it's still above the ground. But if it's not moving, we're talking no, not much in the way of kinetic energy, really. Um, though potential energy still, there's plenty of that. And obviously, again, potential energy is due to position. So imagine a bowling ball has a certain amount of potential energy. If it's held, maybe like, here's, here it is, and here you are trying to catch with your hands, you can catch that because that's some potential energy, not, a, not that much. However, if you're someone's holding on top of a skyscraper and you want to catch that bowling ball, ooh, that's a lot more potential energy. I don't know if you want to catch that one. Because that potential energy, if it drops, the short amounts from here to here, that won't turn into much kinetic energy when it hits your hand, so you can handle that. On the other hand, if it comes all the way down from the top of a tall building, that potential energy is going to turn into so much kinetic energy that you're not going to want to try to catch that. Okay, so that gives you an idea of kinetic versus potential energy. Now, um, this is an analogy. This is a macroscopic example of kinetic energy, the energy of moving versus potential energy, the potential it has to potentially start moving. Um, and then here's like an animation where kinetic and potential energy, like they add up to the same amount. The total energy over time is the same. It's your lot potential energy as it moves, there's less potential energy, more kinetic energy. Then there's not much potential energy, all kinetic energy down here. Then as it goes up here, it's less potential energy, more and more kinetic, sorry, less kinetic energy, more potential energy as it slows down. At some point it stops, then it's all potential energy. Then it would start sliding down the other way as it turns potential energy back into kinetic energy again. So again, that's a macroscopic example. This is chemistry class though. What does this look like inside a molecule or something like that? And the answer is, we've seen examples of this. Like this is something that should be familiar from biology class. Potential energy in molecules is high energy bonds, which release energy when broken. ATP is the example from the biology class that you might remember. It is, the, it is made by the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, because the cell produces ATP as a way of holding that energy. So a lot of times it's likened to a battery. And what ATP does is this bond breaks and it releases energy. So the bond represents potential energy and breaking it the, makes the connect, makes the um, kinetic energy. What is the kinetic energy? Well, the way ATP carries energy to your cells and the things in your cells is it has this high energy bond in the form that's potential energy. And then when it goes to the cell, it breaks that bond open and that causes vibrations. And those vibrations cause the enzymes or structures to move or to do their jobs. So the extra vibration caused is the kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy causes the thing to move or change shape or do whatever it does that causes it to do the thing that it needs to do. So that is our example in biology. Okay, so make sure you have this all copied down as such. But the high energy bond in ATP is the potential energy. And when it breaks and releases, the movement that results from that energy being released is the kinetic energy. So temperature is a measure of energy. I did mention that temperature is an indirect measure of energy. More specifically, it measures the average kinetic energy of the particles. So notice that 
atoms and molecules, they move. In fact, it's the only way to stop them from moving is to cool them down to a temperature so cold it's called absolute zero, where all movement stops. So above that, they're always moving. And the higher the temperature, the more they move. Because more movement means more kinetic energy, more energy of movement. And one other thing, if the particles move more, then they bounce off each other more and push each other further apart. And that's why the red stuff in a thermometer goes up, because when these particles bounce around more and push each other further apart, they force themselves up into the space. And that's what we see is we call it the mercury rising, even though it's not mercury, it's alcohol. Um, it's colored alcohol. It's just the particles expanding because they're vibrating more and pushing each other more apart. Okay, so cold particles vibrate less. The higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy that it has on average, which means they're vibrating more and pushing each other apart more. It's also why you tend to have lower density at high temperatures and more density at lower temperatures, because at lower temperatures, higher density results in the particles compacting more together and more, and more mass per um, unit of volume. So energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So energy can take the form of movement of a physical object. Energy can also take the form of electromagnetic radiation. And although that may sound scary, the light entering your eyeballs is electromagnetic radiation. It's a scary way of just saying light. Now, I will say that there are many kinds of light we can't see. If this was all the light in the universe, you can, you can see barely this much. Because there's other kinds of light like UV, infrared, x-rays, microwaves, and radio waves and things like that that we are not able to view because our eyes are not sensitive to it. But it is light types of light and it is out there. So no matter what it is, all forms of electromagnetic radiation, aka light, whether we can see it or not, moves at the same speed. It travels as a wave, which gives it some interesting weird properties, but we'll save that for physics class. Um, so the very tiny percentage that we can see is what we call visible light. Most forms of electromagnetic radiation are invisible to human eyes, but we can detect them with instruments like an X-ray machine, for example, um, or microwaves, radio waves, all of it. We can detect it with, with instruments of one kind or another. And that includes, by the way, there are certain kinds of light that like ultra ultraviolet or infrared light that insects can see that we can't. So like they can look at a flower and see that it reflects infrared colors of light or sorry, ultraviolet colors of light. And this means that they see different patterns than we do because they can see different sections of the color spectrum than we do. So they can see colors that we can't, just like you know, try explaining red to a colorblind person, if they, a bee would have a hard time explaining certain colors to you because you cannot see them. Um, there's infrared light is what we see as heat because the hotter an object is, the more light it gives off. And even if it's not hot enough to glow like a hot piece of hot metal, it still glows in colors we can't see, infrared. Um, wavelength and energy. Now, I want people to understand that light is a wave with a wavelength. And there are certain types of light, like light is determined by the wavelength it has. A longer wavelength will look different than a shorter wavelength because a wavelength is the distance between two peaks. So uh, this would be a shorter wavelength than this wavelength, for example. And the distance between those two peaks determines how that light interacts with the sensors in our eyes, and our brain processes that as our perception of different colors. The colors are just the creation of your brain. They don't actually exist. Um, it's just your way of recognizing different wavelengths. And so shorter wavelength would be like the higher energy end of the spectrum, which is like purple. Longer wavelength would be the lower energy spectrum, end of the spectrum, which would be like red. And then there's even lower energies that we can't even see, like infrared and microwaves and radios, which are like the wavelength is like a kilometer long, so it's, it's huge. And then on the other hand, there's even shorter wavelengths, like, um, sorry, I can't even talk about it. Ultraviolet and even shorter still, like X-rays and even shorter still, like gamma rays. And by the way, the shorter the wavelength, the more the energy, which is why uh, ultraviolet and x-rays, which are both shorter wavelength than visible light. They're down here in this spectrum. Um, 
They're invisible to the human eye, but they can interact with matter, and they have so much more energy that they will tend to mess with DNA and shatter DNA strands, which is caused the, what you would know as cancer. Um, these, on the other hand, don't have enough energy to do that. So infrared, microwaves, radio waves, they don't really tend to mess with DNA because they just don't have enough energy. All right, there's all kinds of examples of this. Interesting little side bonus fact. The wireless router in your house is the same wavelength as a microwave, which means it has the same properties. Uh, but the only reason why you can't cook dinner with your wireless router is because a microwave is uh, about 1,000 watts of power, whereas this is about 0.1 watts of power. So uh, theoretically, if you put 10,000 wireless routers in one room and turn them all on at once, yes, you can microwave your dinner. Good luck. Um, aside from that, uh, let's see. Some years we give a quiz, some years we don't, but if we do, this is stuff you should know. And even if we don't give a quiz directly over this, you should know this for the test, so just be aware that if you can do these things, then you are good. All right, there you go.